You are listening to Socialist Revolution, a podcast for communists. The recording you're about to hear is from a leadoff by Fred Weston, editor of In Defense of Marxism. This leadoff was for a session on world perspectives at the Central Committee of Socialist Revolution, the U.S. section of the International Marxist Tendency. As communists, we are internationalists. That means that our political analysis cannot just be limited to the country that we live in. Our analysis of the global political situation, our world perspectives, will explain the global crisis of capitalism, the resulting social turmoil, and the development of political consciousness on a world scale. If you agree with our perspectives, reach out to us with the link in the description. Just what is communism? You communist. Communist? A specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Communism. The presence within America of communist propaganda dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Communism, stronger, more determined than ever. Are there communists in this organization? Thousands of Americans actually aiding the communists. The children of present day America will live in a communist society. It's good to be back again here in America, especially after I just looked at the growth figures. And I can reassure you that it's not because I I was looking at GDP of the United States, but the growth figures of the the comrades here. This discussion is on, of course, world perspectives. We always start our general analysis by looking at the world situation, which allows us to understand the events taking place in each single country. You, You couldn't really analyze the United States in isolation, just like you cannot analyze China or any other part of the world without looking at the global picture. And we are truly in a a serious crisis of the capitalist system that affects every country to one degree or another. We have the ongoing war in the Ukraine, uh, which I'll touch on a bit later on. We have the dramatic events in Gaza, which are impacting consciousness around the world. But we also have wars, civil wars, drug wars, terrorist insurgencies, ethnic conflicts. And the latest I saw when I was preparing this lead off was that is the case in 34 countries around the world, one degree or another a violent conflict. You know, you have the wars, the Russia-Ukraine, Israel-Gaza, the civil wars in many countries of Africa and uh, and beyond. I won't give the whole list. But as a result of all this, in 2022, last year, there were officially 108 million people who were displaced. This is the degree of, of the refugee crisis we have around the world. It's truly a humanitarian crisis of immense proportions, which has been created. And it's it, we're only at the beginning of this. When we talk about barbarism, it's there in front of us. If we look at the migrant crisis that this is creating, last year alone, over 250 people attempted to cross the Mediterranean in boats. About 40% were sent back, but uh, the the rest made it. And since 2014, 20,000 people have died in the Mediterranean trying to cross the sea. And they come from places like Syria, Afghanistan, and, and Pakistan, many other countries. And they are fleeing the civil wars, the wars, the hunger, the natural disasters, the huge flooding that's taken place across the world, the the drought, the fact that many people have lost their livelihood because they can no longer farm their land. All of this is feeding this this sea of humanity, which is trying to uh, escape from the hellish life that they lead. And the numbers are are growing all the time. This year alone, 2,000 people have drowned in the Mediterranean trying to cross the sea. And those were the figures up to date in August. In Italy, which is receiving the the large part of this, 127,000 have arrived this year, which is double the figure of last year. This is creating a bit of an embarrassment for the government because the right-wing government came in and part of their election campaigning and, and propaganda was, we're the tough guys, we're going to stop this. And Meloni is finding it a bit diff- more difficult than, than, than just speaking about it, facing twice as many arrivals. In the UK, in spite of Brexit and all the rest of it, they voted to get back control of my immigration. I think last year it was 750,000 arrived. Legally, this is an embarrassing thing for this government too. The right-wing are using this question cynically for electoral reasons to try and whip up a racism, whip up a mood against immigration, blame the migrants for everything instead of the who, who's really to blame. But at the same time, they exploit them because they are cheap labor. So it's a sick joke, actually, to listen to these people because they exploit the, the migrants both politically and economically. Politically, to blame them and, and say, you know, to, to present this this idea to the, to the mass of ordinary working people that we're facing this wave of migrants who are threatening our livelihood. At the same time, when they arrive, they're very good, very useful to, to, to employ at very, very cheap rates. 
The cynicism of the bourgeois has no limits in the way they use this. We have the problem of climate change, which is an ongoing problem. They do a lot of talking about it. The irony of the, the latest is that they use the, 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 the summits to actually make deals on contracts for fuel, fossil fuels. I mentioned that as a detail, but I'm thinking the millions of young people who are being radicalized who follow this, that's going to have an effect on their thinking. Here we are facing this humanitarian disaster and these bastards get together and all they can think of is making contracts to sell more fossil fuel to worsen the situation while they pretend to make concessions verbally. The people affected by hunger globally in 2021, these are the figures I found, were over 800 million, which was an increase of nearly 50 million on the previous year. Over a quarter of a billion people were food insecure and required urgent food assistance in 58 countries that were affected by this. Um, and yet the world produces more than enough food to feed everybody. The, the latest figures I found is that the world would be ca is capable in what it produces of feeding 12 billion people. We actually are only 8 billion. Um, so we can, you know, one and a half times what is necessary. And yet um, in 2022, according to The Guardian, they said after a decade of steady decline, hunger is back on the rise, affecting 10% of the global population. That's what we're talking about. 800 million is 10%. Now, how is that possible? Well, of course, there are problems of distribution, where the food is produced and where it's needed, storage, waste, etc., but also affordability. In March of this year, for example, food prices were ex exceptionally high in countries like Ethiopia, Ghana, Malawi, Myanmar, Namibia, Pakistan, Somalia, etc. Simply, the people can't afford the food and can't get to the food. But it's it's, it's not a problem because sometimes the environmentalists go, go to the extreme and basically say, you know, we're going to have to reduce consumption. We're going to have to reduce uh, development and all the rest of it because there isn't enough. There is more than enough. It's not, the, it's not the production. It's getting the food to the people that need it. And that is because of the system that we live in. World debt, another aspect of the present crisis. We've, we've stressed this figure many times. It's reached $300 trillion globally, and that's about 350% of GDP. And it's increased by 27% since 2007. And for the, the, the perspective is that it will continue to grow, could reach over 350% by the end of this decade, which is not too far away. What's happening is there's a huge, huge buildup of debt. And of course, you know, debt sooner or later has to be paid by somebody. And the question here is, who is going to pay the debt? Now, one of, one of the elements in the French Revolution was precisely who is going to pay the debt that the, 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 the monarchy had ma massively accumulated. Well, the rich refused, the aristocrats, the clergy, the bishops, they were not prepared to pay. They wanted to the poorest layers to pay. Well, we saw how, how that one ended. It didn't go too, too well for some of them. Today, it's the same question. Who is going to pay? They want, again, they want the poor masses to pay. Who has to pay? It's the austerity uh, uh, loaded onto the shoulders of the working class and the poor. And I think we can confidently predict how it's going to end this time around. It will end up in revolutionary movements. We saw what happened in Sri Lanka. Without a leadership, the masses just overturned the regime. The power was there for the taking. Why wasn't it taken? Because there was no organization to lead the working class. There wasn't a party with the clear ideas and understanding of what was necessary. As a consequence of that, Sri Lanka is now at the mercy of the IMF, the World Bank, and the Chinese who have lent a lot of money. The country defaulted and suffered a terrible economic collapse, shortages of, of everything, including tomatoes and fruit. I spoke to the comrades in Sri Lanka, the, the shortages of everything. Again, that's going to cause suffering, but not because the food isn't there, it's because it can't be it can't be got to where it's got to, it's got to go. Now, global debt has trended upwards since the early 70s, and it has risen particularly rapidly in the recent period. The debt is a phenomenon now which affects every country, even China, this massive industrial powerhouse that has developed, has, has developed de debts at all levels. Now, how, how did that happen? In the 70s, there was a, a wave of intense class struggle. The workers were fighting to claw back. There was high inflation. They were fighting to maintain their wage levels. Now, I don't want to go into the details of it. We know how that period ended because of the leadership of the working class. The idea of austerity, sacrifices, compromise was sold to the working class. The movements were held back and the situation swung the other way by the end of the 70s, early 80s. And then we had a massive offensive against the working class, which did significantly reduce wages in terms of the share of national income that goes to wages. I have the figures here for the United States from 1947 to 2000. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but if you see that period there shows you what a significant decline wages had in overall income. What does that mean? Well, it explains another phenomenon. I have, I have the same figures here for Britain, but I don't want to show you all, all of the
the details, but this is um, profit margins. And if you look, this is this is this is the eighties. This is what happens later: a massive increase in profit margins. Now, this attack on the working class over the share of wealth that goes to the working class or the, or the bourgeois leads to a situation clearly where the overall capacity to produce and to sell exceeds the capacity to purchase, and that inevitably means that the system can only survive by increasing debt. And here is here these are the figures I have for credit. Again, I, I mean I don't, I don't know how your eyesight is, is, but this is this is the UK, the same period from the early 80s, late 70s to early. You see the way credit massively goes up and up and up. Now that explains how the system can actually get round the contradictions that it has within it, but only for a period of time. Now it can it can last even decades, but eventually it will produce such a huge debt that it starts to transform into its opposite. Here I have the figures for, it says here that this is a title from a research, $2 trillion interest bill that's hitting governments. $2 trillion interest bill. I'm not talking about the debt. I'm talking about the interest on the debt. And again, this is the graph for the period 2001, and this is the predicted levels. And as you can see, from $2 trillion, they reckon that by 2028, that's in about four or five years' time, it will be $3.3 billion. $3.3 billion paid in interest to speculators, literally, to the bankers, to the capitalists who, who play around with this um, with this money. That reaches a point where a limit is reached and then something serious has to happen in the system. And what we're ve seeing today, the ongoing crisis, is an expression of this. And this is also expressed in the deep pessimism of the bourgeois itself. I've quoted this guy before, Martin Wolf, back in January, in an article in the Financial Times, the title was, We Must Tackle the Looming Global Debt Crisis Before It Is Too Late. And he quotes the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, who says, About 15% of low-income countries are already in debt distress, and an additional 45% are at high risk of debt distress. Among emerging markets, about 25% are at high risk and facing default-like borrowing spreads. We saw what happened in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka they basically collapsed. But what was the situation in Sri Lanka? The, the percentage of GDP that goes to service debt, service debt, I repeat, to pay the interest, was 115% in Sri Lanka. That means Sri Lanka didn't have a debt to GDP of 115%, which is already bad enough. It had a debt service to GDP of 115%. That means everything that was produced in Sri Lanka in a whole year wasn't enough simply to pay the interest. That means that kind of debt simply keeps growing. Even if you don't borrow any more, it keeps growing and growing and growing because you can't pay the interest. Or you have to borrow more simply to pay the interest. But in Ghana, it was 53%. Egypt, Egypt, 44%. Zambia, 41%. And it goes on. There's another, another element here that we have to consider is in the past, the IMF and the World Bank would dictate terms. Today, we have China, which is a big player. China also lends money. China is exporting capital on a massive scale and is using it, obviously, as, as, a, as leverage and to spread its interest and to widen its sphere of influence. In the period 2000 to 2021, China made 128 bailout loans worth $240 billion to 20 countries that were in financial distress. And just to give you an example, Zambia's debt, one third of it is to China. Now that creates a problem for the IMF and the World Bank. In the past, they would be expressing the interests of Western imperialism, basically the Europeans, the Japanese, the Americans, the North Americans. Now China comes in with its own interest, pushing its own policy in contradiction with that of the imperialist powers. The question of inflation has now appeared in the, in the last two or three years, but inflation was already beginning to take off before the Ukraine war. You know, they blame the Ukraine war. It's an element, but it was already growing. You can't have this level of debt accumulating over such a long period of time, not backed up by real production. And this was particularly clear during the pandemic. There was the accumulation of the credit, which I referred to earlier on, the state spending to stimulate the economy. And then you have the situation in the pandemic where they literally paid millions of people to not produce anything. At a certain point, you're going to see inflation. And we saw that in Europe and other parts of the world, over 10% inflation, different levels in different countries, but nonetheless, high levels of inflation. But in a country like Argentina, inflation now is 140%. In Turkey, it's 60%. In Egypt, it's 36%. In Nigeria, it's 30%. There's many other countries you could quote on that. But an interesting comment in a recent article from the Financial Times, again from Martin Wolf, and the title of the article is The Looming Threat of Fiscal Crisis. He says, if governments are going to avoid the risks of debt 
explosion and are also not going to resort to surprise inflation or financial repression, they will have to tighten what are mostly still ultra-loose fiscal policies. But will they dare to do so in aging societies with slowly growing economies and expanding defense burdens? And then he says at the end, painful fiscal choices seem to lie ahead. So after the period of the pandemic, where they threw out the old policies of, of uh, tight, you know, tight fiscal policies, tight financial policies, and they had to do that in order for the system to survive that moment of crisis, they're now moving back towards tightening up with all the consequences that that will have. And one of the consequences, of course, is the rising rate of interest around the globe. The European Central Bank has had to raise rates from close to zero, as they were up until recently, to around 4%. The Federal Reserve has done the same, bringing it up from about just above zero to over 5%. This is having an impact on global growth. There's an article in the Financial Times from September. Global trade falls at fastest pace since the pandemic. And I quote, world trade volumes fell at their fastest annual pace for almost three years in July, according to closely watched figures that signal that rising interest rates are beginning to affect global demand for goods. And demand for global goods exports has weakened on the back of higher inflation. So you have the inflation, which eats into purchasing power. In order to bring down the inflation, they've imposed this policy of, of rising interest rates, which has begun to bring down inflation rates in the advanced capitalist countries at least. But as another article from November, end of November says in the Financial Times, inflation fall, falls mask bumps on the last mile for central bank. Uh, and they're talking about the, the fact that although it's come down, they're worried that it's not going to come down sufficiently and it could rise again. Similar figures for the US. You see, the, the price they had to pay to get inflation down, as I said, is the high rate of interest everywhere. And this has provoked a slowdown in spending to bring down inflation and it's having an effect on trade. Therefore, they fix one thing, but something else breaks as they do it because they can't fix the, the contradictions of capitalism as a whole. It's having an effect on China. Economic situation in China is dramatically changing because of this. You couldn't have a discussion about Chinese perspectives without discussing the fact that China's trade outlets, its access to markets has been affected by this situation. The two biggest markets of China are Western Europe and North America. And these are the two areas where you see the effects of these policies in terms of the market. And this is having an effect of pushing the economy either into recession, so many countries are already in recession, or very slow rates of growth. They've come to the point now where you read articles that show Italy is expected to grow by 0.7%. And it's presented as this massive victory that they've achieved. Basically, they're talking about stagnation of, of the economy economy, growing at very low rates. Draghi, the ex-governor um, of the European Central Bank, has actually predicted that Europe will soon be in, in recession. Um, but just to show you the effect on China, I have here the figures for Chinese growth. Quoting from an article here, China, the world's largest goods exporter, posted a 1.5% annual fall in exports, the Eurozone a 2.5% contraction, and the US a 0.6% decrease. The, all these major economic blocks are seen falls in exports because of this global scenario. But here I have the growth figures from 1992 predicted to 2028 for China. I think you can see where, where the graph is going. A gradual slowdown and it continues to slow and it's predicted to continue doing that in the next period. Now, this is actually having an effect inside China, a social economic effect. And China is also suffering a phenomenon which is up until around, let's say, 2021, more or less, the the comparison between China and the US, i.e. what, how big is Chinese economy compared to the US, which is the biggest, and between 2001 and roughly 2021, 2022, the Chinese economy was growing. And this is the graph. Look at that. That is China getting stronger and stronger and stronger until the recent period. China has now contracting in terms of its relative strength vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And this is a problem for the Chinese. I, articles here from the Financial Times Times, the article says China rise is reversing. And it's interesting to see the comments that China's rise is an, as an economic power is reversing. The biggest global story of the past half century may be over. Then it says its share of the global economy rose nearly tenfold from below 2% in 1990 to 18.4% in 2021. No nation has ever risen so far so fast. It was phenomenal. Then the reversal began. In 2022, China's share of the world economy shrank a bit. This year, it will shrink more significantly to 17%. That two-year drop of 
20% is the largest since the 60s. This is a dramatic turnaround that's taking place for China. It says here that, well, I, I can't go into all the, I would take too long to read all of this, but what it highlights is this dramatic turnaround, falling investments, even Chinese investors are shifting their money. Now, the consequences of this is having on China is expressed in this article from the Financial Times from November, the breakdown of China's social contract. And it says, I'll just quote one paragraph. As China's economic growth slows, stories such as Zoo, and it's describing the difficulties of a particular individual little businessman, the country's 296 million migrant workers are facing slowing wage growth. Its new university graduates are struggling to find jobs. The urban middle class has lost money in a policy-induced property meltdown. I could go on and on and on. It's a very pessimistic read, but this is now creating the phenomenon of growing levels of strikes in China China and the emergence of the phenomenon of unpaid wages that we had a few years back. If you remember, there was this big phenomenon of unpaid wages provoking waves of strikes. This is now coming back because the companies are not able to pay because they've lost on a global scale. As you can see, you would not be able to understand that just by analyzing China on its own. You've got to analyze it within the global situation. The result is that Moody's has actually cut China's credit outlook. Here is the number two economic power facing this. Now, shifting to Russia. Russia, before the war, Unemployment was growing. Real incomes were falling, minus 4.3% in 2020. Inflation in 2021 was 8.4%. Interest rates were rising. Putin's approval rating was falling. This was prior to the war. As you can see, he had many good reasons to go to war, but also the, the, the recovery of Russia after the collapse in the 90s, combined also with this pressure, the United States in particular, I'll come to that in a minute, a massive power, but in relative decline, struggling to claw back its influence, in the inevitably means conflict on a global scale. And the push in Europe of NATO ever eastwards was part of that. Inevitably, it was going to lead to conflict at some point, And that's what led to the war in the Ukraine. But the, the West, they believe that they are the international community. When, when you hear, you read an article, that says the international community says this. What it means is us Americans and our friends in Europe, who actually only represent 25% of the global world community. And that was revealed precisely during the Ukraine war. In Back in May, the Spectator says this. The West embarked on its sanctions against Russia with an exaggerated sense of its own influence around the world. Well, what is the real situation? According to Bloomberg, an article in November, key sectors of Russia's economy are adapting and in some cases completely rebounding from unprecedented international sanctions imposed over the war in the Ukraine. It goes on about the recovery of different sectors. Annual growth accelerated to 5.5% in the third quarter of this year, according to the statistics. Uh, the result, the fastest pace of growth in more than a decade, aside from a spike when Russia exited COVID lockdowns, etc. So the sanctions have not had the effect they wanted because the influence both of Western Europe and the US is not what it was. The power isn't the same. They're still very important, obviously, and the US is still by far the, the, the biggest single powerful country, especially militarily, but relatively a lot weaker. Now, this is also being reflected in the Ukraine. The Ukraine war is not going according to plan. It was supposed to be sanctions will squeeze Russia. Putin is, is, is going to die tomorrow. He's got this, he's, that. he's in a terrible place. There's going to be a coup. He's going to go. They got the calculations completely wrong. And an article from September in The Guardian, time is running out for Ukraine's counteroffensive. Its allies will be crucial in what comes next. But the Telegraph on the 10th of September was much clearer. And you remember the Telegraph in Britain, is a, it, they call it the Tory graph because it's such a reactionary right-wing paper. The title of one of its articles was Ukraine's counteroffensive is stalling. This was in September. The West must prepare for humiliation. I think that's pretty clear what they're saying there. What's happening in the Ukraine is that the offensive has completely failed, the so-called counteroffensive. Not only has it failed, Russia today holds more territory than before the counteroffensive. And actually, if there's a counteroffensive of any kind that you can just talk about, it's a Russian one where they're advancing on certain parts of the front. This is opening up cracks inside the Ukraine. Zelensky has come up, out in conflict openly with the top general. Zelensky's wife, I think, is the most sensible person in the Ukraine at the moment, saying, to, to Zelensky, don't stand again for president and um, let's get back to having a family life. She's probably thinking, listen, you want to get assassinated, you stand as president. If you want to live a little bit longer, we can go off somewhere nice like the Bahamas or whatever. And they're even making jokes like that. The irony, he was a comedian before this. There is a conflict because the, the top generals themselves in the Ukraine are drawing the conclusion this can't continue. They, they're finding it difficult to replenish their military forces. Young men, some of them are trying to get out. Others are looking for the medical certificate 
difficult to get out of military service. Why offer to fight in a war which now seems unwinnable? One thing is if, if the offensive was going forward, you could imagine a different mood, but it's not. The Economist of the 30th of November, an article that says, Putin seems to be winning war in Ukraine. Seems, seems. It, it's there, you can, you, can, you can lock it up and read it. I haven't got time to, to quote it. But the, another article, Russia is poised to take advantage of political splits in the Ukraine. And it talks about the cracks in the regime. Also, the changing mood in Europe and America in terms of the willingness of people to tolerate the continued military aid to the Ukraine without it producing anything significant. One little note on Boris Johnson. If you remember when he rushed to the Ukraine to tell them no, no deal, because there were beginnings of some kind of negotiation, put a stop to it. That man is responsible, has his big, a big share of the death of thousands of young men on both sides, both Russian soldiers and Ukrainian soldiers and civilians, for their own cynical imperialist interests. The same goes for Biden and all the others, but they've miscalculated. Biden is actually not getting any advantage from this. It's, it's backfired on him completely. It's completely failed, and Trump is finding it very easy to criticize him on, on, on this front. Now, I've got to skip forward a little bit. The question of world relations at the moment. Going back to Lenin, Lenin, when he re in, in imperialism, he referred to the, quote, the final partition of the globe. Final, not in the sense, this is what it, not in the sense that repartition is impossible. On the contrary, repartitions are possible and inevitable, in, but in the future, only redivision is possible. I, once you've, once in, the world has been completely taken over by imperialism, the way one power can gain is at the expense of another. There's no longer territories that you can go in and just colonize like in the early days. And this, this is being expressed today. The repartition that's taking place, the, the spheres of influence which are taking place um, on a grand scale. It, this is expressed in the relative decline of the United States, the weakening of the European powers, but also the recovery of Russia, the rise of China in spite of the, the, the weakening in, in, the, in the most recent period, and with it, the emergence of secondary powers such as in India, Brazil, South Africa, and, and others, they are expressing a more independent policy, let's say. And that was expressed when the G20 met back in September. The, the Americans and the Europeans, they wanted a resolution that firmly condemned the Russians. They couldn't get it. These powerful imperialist countries couldn't get that into the resolution. It was being held in India, and the Indians, the Indian economy, which by the way, has become, in terms of GDP, absolute GDP, is ahead of France, the UK, Italy, I think it's the fourth or the fifth, I can't remember the figures. Well, the Indian economy and the Indian bourgeois have no interest in imposing sanctions on Russia, which will damage India. So they're not applying them. They're actually buying the oil from the Russians. The Chinese are in there. It shows you the, the shifts in the balance of forces globally. There is a continuous, con continuing conflict, such as across the Pacific, between China and the United States. Taiwan is a hotspot the, in the middle of this conflict. And there you have the potential for another Ukraine in the future. You, you can imagine, a declining China economically, therefore, with internal tensions growing, the tendency there is to try and export your problems by coming into conflict with other powers over spheres of influence. The US is facing a similar scenario, therefore the tensions between the powers will increase. And at some stage, this could happen. It's not on the cards yet. I don't think any of them really want to go down that road because of the consequences, but it's part of the possible scenario in the future. And if that did happen, the consequences would be far more devastating than anything the Ukraine war has produced. Can you imagine number one power imposing sanctions on number two globally? Talk about falling trade figures. There would be a collapse in, 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 in the world economy, we'd be in, in a severe crisis. I wanted to comment on one, one writer in the, econ in the Evening Standard. He's a guy called Dan Dancona. He's uh, the chairman of a liberal conservative think tank. He writes for different papers, and there's no way you could accuse him of being on the left. This is what he says about the United States. Poll after poll has shown that US voters remain generally pessimistic about the economy and resolutely unwilling to give Biden credit for what improvements they, they do acknowledge in their standard of living. There's a bit of an economic upturn, but they don't, um, don't see Biden as being responsible for that. But on the more general attitude of people to the system, this is what he says. Confidence in capitalism was shattered by the 2008-2009 financial crisis and its aftermath, which suggested that the system was not only a... Listen, 
listen to this. This is a, this is a conservative. Eh? Not only a deranged casino, but structurally rigged to favor the rich over the poor. What indeed is the economy in 2023? The traditional indicators, inflation, mortgage rates, employment levels, not only not, now tell only half the story. As the nature of work has been revolutionized and so many employees barely scratch out a living in the gig economy. It continues. The proliferation of food banks, fuel banks, and baby banks providing essentials for infants reflects intolerable levels of inequality. And then he makes a little comment. He says, when voters watch Sunak interviewing Elon Musk, they no longer see two role models, symbols of aspiration, but a dramatization of the system's fundamental unfairness. It reflects a collapse of trust, not only in basic economic justice, but in the principal institutions upon which society is founded, from the political system via the media to the rule of law itself. This is a comment of a conservative think tank representative on the situation we face. What this reflects is a change in the consciousness of billions of working people around the world. That's what this is talking about. And we as Marxists, we understand that conditions determine consciousness. A change in conditions changes the consciousness. And the conditions have changed. They've dramatically changed. And it's having an effect, as, and we're feeling it. As Marx explained, I'll quote, this is from the preface to Capital by Marx. The changes in the economic foundations lead sooner or later to the transformation of the whole immense superstructure. In studying such transformations, it is always necessary to distinguish between the material transformation of the economic conditions of production, which can be determined with the precision of natural science, and the legal, political, religious, artistic, or philosophical, in short, ideological forms in which men become conscious of this conflict and fight it out. Now, he said he's referring to two aspects. One is the economic side, which you can calculate, but the other is the way it's expressed, basically, in the thinking of humans, in their outlook. Now, human consciousness is elastic. It can take time to come into synchrony with the actual objective situation. You can have, like in 2008, we predicted what was going to happen. We sensed what that crisis would produce. Why? Well, because we're Marxists and we look at history, we look at the way the system works, we work out where it's going because of its contradictions and the inevitable impact that will have on consciousness. But the mass of ordinary people don't spend their time reading and participating in study groups about Marxist economics. They react to the events and quite often they react with a delay. Also because of the leadership, because of the mass propaganda, the media, they hope that it'll be a temporary thing, that we'll get back to the good old days, things will get back there. And they're prepared to wait and even to a degree, suffer the consequences of this, but inevitably, like an elastic band, it snaps back and it comes into sync with the real situation. And this is in fact what we saw after the 2008 crisis. There was a delay, but eventually it provoked radicalization. We saw a number of political formations that reflected this process. This was, the, in effect, the first wave, you could say, of this radicalization. We had, for example, Podemos in Spain, which was founded in January 2014. You see the, the delay, which was founded in the aftermath of the anti-austerity movement of 2011-2012. So first you had the, the mass protests against the impact with a little bit of delay after 2008. This then provoked a political radicalization which found an expression in formations like Podemos. In January, the, the dates are important, 2014 in Spain. In 2015, January 2015, Syriza is elected, becomes the largest party. This was a party of 4%, catapulted to 3, 36% and getting half the MPs in Parliament. This was a reaction to the austerity imposed by the previous right-wing government. Here in America, in the United States, you had Sanders who sought to be the candidate for the Democratic Party. And you remember the massive move me meetings, the online meetings, the big rallies, um, the big surge in support. And he was talking, he, the language that he, he used then was an expression of the radicalization in, in society when he talked about the political revolution against the billionaire class. You all, you all remember that. Then we had the Jeremy Corbyn phenomenon in um, September 2015. In France, we had the phenomenon of Jean-Luc Mélenchon and the rise of the France Insoumise in 2016. You see, in that period, 2014-16, in one country after another, very similar phenomenon, not exactly the same. Sanders is not a Jeremy Corbyn and he's not a Syriza, but it's an expression of the same process. What has happened since then? Look at them, all of these parties. They've all, in one way or another, either betrayed or disappointed their supporters. Corbyn, personally speaking, I suppose, hasn't shifted that much. But he didn't take the fight to the right wing of the Labour Party. 
He succumbed to the pressure of the accusations of anti-Semitism, which were completely false. And what about your friend Sanders? I think you know what he's like. I was on the plane to, to Geneva for the Francophone School, and I picked up a copy of the New York Times, and there was a full-page article by Sanders, and the title of the article was Bernie Sanders, Justice for the Palestinians and Security for Israel. He couldn't even bring himself to use the word ceasefire. He talks about a lengthier pause. So his, his radicalism goes to, instead of two days, make it three or, or whatever, and then you can bomb them again. That's how far he's gone. What about the, the Syriza? The Syriza in a, is in a state of complete collapse. Its vote has gone from the 36th peak of uh, when it was first elected. The opinion polls now put Syriza at 12%. It's lost two thirds of the vote. Even the PASOK has amazingly made a small comeback at 10, at 10%. But what's more interesting about Greece is that, you know, when they have the opinion polls, one is the votes. So the Communist Party of Greece, the Kukwe, is on 8%. But when they have the popularity ratings of individual leaders, well, the most popular at 47% is the leader of the Kukwe, which is an amazing turnaround. But who are the two most unpopular leaders in Greece? Well, one is the far right, and that's everybody hates them except their own minority of supporters. But the next one is the present leader of Syriza. That's how far they've gone from the huge popularity to immense unpopularity because they were in government. This is what's happened to that process of radicalization. But I'm raising it because I want to touch on something else. Inflation that hit across the globe has, and it always has in history, if you look at it, it forces the workers to come out in struggle. Even the most moderate worker is transformed into a militant when inflation is, is at a high level for a prolonged period of time because they literally can't pay the mortgage. They can't pay the rent. They can't uh, clothe their kids. They can't pay the school fees, etc., etc. And therefore, you see this rising wave of class struggle throughout history. At the end of the First World War, it was an important element. The 70s, it was an important element. Inflation over 20%, 25% in some countries. Huge waves of, of class struggle. And we had that here in the recent period. And even, even today, it's, um, it's taking place. So what we saw was the working class, the youth, disappointed, in effect, by the political leaders who express that wave of radicalization. With the impact of the economic crisis, the, the class struggle moved to the, to, the, to the union front, to the industrial front. And we see the strikes in Britain, for example. There's a title here from January of last year in a magazine called Money Week, and it was about Britain. The title was, Ask for a Pay Rise, Everyone Else Is. The first half was, We Can't Afford to Strike. The second half was, We Can't Afford Not to Strike. Uh, and they're on the streets striking. So we, we've had this wave of class struggle in several countries that affected the United States. Uh, you saw it with union drives. The unions are back on the scene as a point of reference. But also the, the, the situation faced by the youth is one of every, everywhere you see these articles. This generation is the first generation that's going to be worse off than its parents. And they just the, the fat accumulated from the past has been consumed. And there's a new generation looking at a future, well, no, no future in effect. In Germany, this industrial powerhouse in the heart of Europe, a Financial Times article it says everything is tired here. Gloom spreads through German manufacturing. They're being affected by this global situation. And it says how German industry has gone from being the powerhouse of, of Europe to one of the region's worst performers after a series of shocks. And it refers to industrial production, which is slowing down. But then it also refers to the huge strikes they had earlier this year. We also have the political phenomena such as Argentina, where the so-called progressives, as they call them, but they were responsible for carrying out austerity. And that's the problem they have, the serious bourgeois. The so-called serious politicians of the bourgeois, the establishment politicians, what message do they have for the masses? Well, I just quoted the Financial Times. Title fiscal policy, austerity, basically a very difficult message, but you've got to accept it. Well, the problem is the millions of people don't accept it. That explains the populism, the so-called the, the so right, uh, right populism that has emerged, which is ex being expressed such as what we saw in Argentina. Before that, we saw it with Bolsonaro. Here you have it with, with Trump. That's the, that's the shorthand explanation, of course. I haven't got time to go into the details of that. But we see consciousness now is moving on further. We had that expression in the 2014-15 period, followed by the wave of strikes, the inflation, the effects of the war in the Ukraine, the effects of the general crisis on consciousness. And this is f further changing the mood. In Britain, for example, the Tories, where they tapped into that working class vote through Brexit by, again, promising the workers of Britain that you'll be better off 
if you vote to leave the European Union. And of course, no benefits have come from it because it's capitalism. It hasn't changed the fundamental nature of the system. Well, the latest figures show that only about half of those working class voters that voted for the Tories in 2019 intend to vote again for the Tories. The Tories are collapsing uh, on the electoral front and Labour is about 20 percentage points ahead of the Tories. But what's interesting is that of those who are not going to vote Tory, only once a section says they'll vote Labour. There's a section, gr a growing layer, who can't see the difference between the so-called left and the right in politics. In Britain, a poll carried out in autumn of last year revealed that 43% of the population thought socialism was the ideal economic system. Among the youth, that is 18 to 34, it was 53%. And then we have all the opinion polls in all these countries that reveal what is shocking for the bourgeois, a significant percentage, particularly of the youth, consider communism as the best possible system and the best system that can respond to the um, crisis. Now, of course, they will try and confuse things by saying, oh, they, they, they think that Stalin was great or that uh, the dictatorship was great. The youth are looking at the system they live under, wars, famine, the migrant crisis, the climate crisis, the, all the future predictions, the level of rent. It's an impossible to get a mortgage. The jobs you get are temporary, low wage. This is the reality facing the youth. There are some amongst the older generation that cannot understand why these young people, um, at least a section of them, look to communism as an answer. It's because they're not quite living in the same conditions. As we said, conditions determine consciousness. And it's this condition of the youth that explains this phenomenon that we've encountered. Another point we have to highlight is the way they use figures and statistics to create this image that, oh, it's everybody's going to the right, fascism, etc. Just a few, a, a little detail. Macron, actually, in the first round, he got about 24, 25% support. That's the real support of those who voted. So active support is probably about 20%. In the same France that Macron wins, and then it, with this is presented as, aha, the Conservatives have won. The opinion polls show that 75% of the population was against Macron's pension reform. Well, that fits with those that voted. 75% did not vote for Macron. That's the truth of the matter. And then it was expressed on the streets. A lot of those people on the streets striking and protesting, of course, they didn't vote for Macron. Some of them probably didn't even vote. But people that don't vote doesn't mean they don't count in society. People that don't vote can occupy factories. They can carry out demonstrations. They can go on picket lines. And the real opinions are expressed on that front. Just to give an example of Italy, Meloni's center-right, center-right. You, you see, you can't be too extreme here. There's no left and right. There's center-right and center-left. Just slightly to one side of center. I.e. what they're saying is they're exact, almost exactly the same. Her coalition won with nearly 44% of the vote, but that was 44% of the 60% that voted, which means that actually only 26% of the overall electorate actually voted for the coalition. That's the fact of the matter. It means three quarters of Italians did not vote for Meloni, but you wouldn't, that's not highlighted by the media because the message they want to get across is, oh, society has gone to the right, but it's just not true. Just a, It doesn't take much. I'm not a brilliant mathematician, but I can um, work out percentages and, and um, fractions and um, and realize what is actually happening. And in the many countries, a lower, a lower participation in elections is also reflected in that. Now, it's in the midst of this that we have the Palestine question emerging. Now, we've said it in articles. The Palestinian question is what is is like a catalyst, which is which is crystallizing more and more left and right, i.e. working class and bourgeois. It's a class question that's emerging. It's sim certain similarities, you could say, with the, the effect of the Vietnam War in the 60s and 70s, which also coalesced, you know, brought together attention, young youth protests, and then add to, the, to that the fact that they, they shot students protesting against the Vietnam War, further radicalizing the youth in America in the, in the 70s. Something similar is happening here. Millions of workers and youth, billions maybe on a global scale, are watching on their TV screens the barbarism that's taking place in, um, in Gaza and the incessant bombing and destruction of the whole strip. They have made Gaza City uninhabitable. They are now in the process of doing the same to Khan Yunus in the south. Some of the most bitter fighting is taking place in the south now as, as the Israeli soldiers go in. But the displaced people of the north are being told now to move again from the south, where? To a little strip on the beach, which is wasteland, without a sewage system, without water supply, without housing, literally being told to camp out in the open, either there or the Rafa, Rafa, which is right on the border with Egypt. That's where they're, they're, they're pushing them to. This is from the New York Times from the other day. They've instructed people in an area that includes part of Khan Yunis to leave
leave for the southern border city of Rafa, already overcrowded with displaced people. Nearly 1.9 million people, or about 85% of the total population of Gaza, have fled their homes, squeezing into an area that covers less than one third of the territory. It's a huge humanitarian disaster which is being prepared. This cannot go by without having an impact on consciousness of millions of workers who identify with the people of Gaza and what they're suffering. It's destabilizing the Middle East. Here's another report from the New York Times about the situation in Bahrain. It says here that the war in Gaza that followed the attack has not only had laid bare a chasm between many Arab leaders and their people, it has wider widened it. It's highlighting the fact that the Arab peoples in each country can see the big division between them and their own leaders who have made deals to normalize relations with with Israel. I could go into the details, but basically you're describing here Bahrain. Remember 2011, Bahrain had massive protests. They were put down brutally with the help of the Emirates and uh, the Saudis who provided the troops to crush that revolt. Well, now this is coming back up. It's re-emerging. And it's not just Bahrain. It's in Jordan. It's in Egypt. It's in many of these Arab countries. It's fomenting revolt from below in the Middle East. And it's also having a knock-on effect around the globe in many countries with these big, big protests. Lots of articles about the barbarity of the situation, the pace of, of, of the killing of civilians. Here is here's an article from the New York Times. The pace of killing of civilians has been much greater than in most other recent conflicts. The only one that I know of that compares is perhaps the Rwanda genocide in 1994. This is having an effect on consciousness. Interesting, an article that shows that even within Jewish American families, there's a divide between the young generation and the older generation with young American Jewish uh, the youth um, looking at the history of, the, of, of this um, part of the world and looking at what was done, radicalizing and sympathizing with the plight of the, pal of the Palestinian uh, peoples. Combined with this is the repression of the pro-Palestine movement. Here I have an article from the New York Times. It refers to anti-Semitism on the campuses, so-called anti-Semitism, i.e. if you express solidarity with the people of Palestine, you are anti-Semitic. Now, where does that, where the hell does that fit with reality? Uh, there are many Jews who have been on the street protests solid, in solidarity with the Palestinians. To be pro-Palestinian does not mean to be anti-Jewish. It means to be against the Zionist project of building a, a country on the land of another people and then not even allowing them to have at least some semblance of a homeland. That's what it, that's that's what it means. But just to conclude on this, talking about Harvard University, and they were, says, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about anti-Semitism? And um, the, uh, one, one of the, one of the uh, professors here is saying that, no, we don't tolerate anti-Semitism, blah, 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 blah. But the concluding remark of the article, I, this struck me, uh, referring to the comment of this, um, uh, one, one of the, I don't know, governor or whatever of, the, of Harvard, says, her statement did not say what would constitute a threat or whether chance of, listen to this, there is only one solution, Intifada revolution. I don't know I've heard that one before, would meet the definition, as Mr. Fanick argued during the hearing. So if you chant that, you're, you're presented being anti-Semitic. This repression, even arrest of people on demonstrations, in some countries, the total banning of demonstrations, Germany is really hard. The German-speaking world, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, very, very severe anti-pro-Palestine uh, activities. This is highlighting the censorship, the lack of real democracy, the, ra the la they talk about the right to free speech. This is feeding in to the radicalization of, of millions of, of young people. And what we're seeing is this. Palestine has become like, as I said, a catalyst in, in the context of a global situation of an economic and social crisis, which is leading to political polarization to the left and to the right. It's leading to waves of class struggle around the world. And from this is emerging a revolutionary consciousness amongst a layer of the population. That's how we explain the success of the Are You a Communist? campaign. We have a separate point on that, but it's, it doesn't fall from the sky. It's a product of this whole scenario. And even, even this phenomenon of some ki kids that we've met, are you socialist? Because if you are, no, I'm a communist. I've, I've, I've had that reported to me so many times. What does it mean? It means I'm not a Sanders type socialist. I'm not a Syriza type socialist. I'm not a Labour Party type socialist. Who, what? They betray. No, no. I'm a revolutionary, so I'm a communist. This is the product of the recent period, and we are 
tapping into that because the, the it, this shows you how a discussion on perspectives is so tightly connected to a discussion on tasks and organization. It's from the perspectives that the analysis flows that leads us to, the, to draw the conclusion that there is this layer that we can connect with and we can strengthen the forces of Marxism through this process and start to build that organization which the working class urgently needs to break the deadlock, let's say, of, of the situation that we've seen for decades and begin the transformation of society. That's all I have to say.